All right, we're on. This is the College of Complex. I didn't remember what I said. David Ramsey Clark. And our Uh, in, in this period, he 
conceived a deep hatred for the British Empire. He then went to Paris uh, and quickly ran out of money and lived the life of a down and out. Uh, and uh, he uh, made, a, made a living as he could by dishwashing in restaurants. He was a bon jour. Um, and um, then he came back to England and um, having entered into this life as a down and, down and out, living with the poorest members of society, he decided to make uh, something of a specialty of it, and he started going and living with tramps and hobos <laughs> who just wandered <laughs> around the English countryside. <laughs> um, <clears throat> his first book to be published was Down and Out in Paris and London. And he had to come up, he decided he, he wouldn't use his real name, which he didn't like. He didn't like the name Eric Blair. Uh, and uh, he suggested to his sister, who was talking to the publisher, a number of alternatives, one of which was George Orwell, and that's what they decided to call him. Um, so from then on, he was George Orwell. People who'd known him all along always called him Eric Blair. People who now made his acquaintance uh, called him George Orwell. So, um, jump forward slightly, in, in 1935 he decided to go and live, having lived with tramps in the south of England, he decided to go and live, or at least make a quick tour of people in impoverished conditions in the north of England. I should explain something at this point about uh, the condition of Britain at this point. Um, in the 1920s, when uh, the rest of the world had, had a boom, Britain had a slump. So Britain had a slump in the 1920s. Uh, and in the 1930s, when there was a, a slump manufactured in the United States of America that afflicted the whole world, the slump in Britain got worse. Um, but at the same time, parts of Britain were developing quite rapidly economically. And so in the 1930s, you had this phenomenon of the distressed areas. That's to say, most people in Britain were doing better economically than they had been doing for quite some time. But there was extreme poverty concentrated in certain old industrial areas, basically. South Wales, parts of Yorkshire, parts of Lancashire, Northern Ireland, uh, these were the places uh, where um, there was this extreme time side, where there was this extreme poverty. And they, they were the, the, the phrase for this was the distressed areas. And, the, and people wrote articles about this. Um, it was a, a favorite topic. Uh, and the pe most people in England were not uh, terribly badly off by traditional standards. But they read books about how shocking it was that people in parts of Britain were living in these terrible conditions. Uh, in <coughs> In the early 1930s, there was um, a huge bestseller in Britain called Love on the Dole uh, by Walter Greenwood, who was himself a person from a slum in the north of England. Uh, so it seemed a natural thing at that point to have the author of Down and Out in Paris and London, in other words, someone who published a book about living with the destitute go to the north of England and um, look around and write something about it. So Orwell went to the north of England, which he'd never been to before. The only part of, of England, that, the only part of Britain that Orwell ever knew well was the area just around London, Thames Valley. That's, that's basically where he grew up. It wasn't where he was born. He, he was born in India, strangely enough. His father was an Indian civil servant. But, um, his mother and uh, brought him and his sister back to England pretty quickly. And the father stayed there working in India for the civil service. He had an interesting job. His job was to supervise the quality assessment of the opium crop that was grown in India for export to China. And, um, anyway, it was quite common in those days for 
uh, someone in the Imperial Civil Service to, uh, to take a wife um, and um, after a year or two the wife and any kids that have resulted would go back to England and the husband would, uh, <coughs> would uh, stay there out in some imperial outlets. Of course India was the plum who was, had the highest prestige of all parts of the British Empire. So that was all well background. <coughs> He didn't come from a wealthy background. It came from a rather shabby background, but it was a very uh, consciously snobbish background. That's why they sent him to a minor public school where he got this uh, scholarship to eat. So Orwell went to the north of England uh, in 1936, early 1936. Um, Did you and uh, he wrote a book about it, which, which became known as The Road to Wigan Pier. And The <coughs> Road to Wigan Pier is, is an extremely interesting book, or I should say, half of it is an extremely interesting book. The Road to Wigan Pier, uh, the first half of it, Banana Royal. is about how terrible conditions are in the north of England. And detailed accounts of how uh, insanitary and smelly and nasty life is for poor people in the north of England. Uh, the second half of the book is all about Orwell's view of the world, uh, where he explains what he thinks about everything, um, uh, arising out of his reflection on looking at poverty in the north of England. And that book, The Road to Wigan Pier, represents Orwell's conversion to socialism. From that point when he wrote that book, he called himself a socialist, uh, and we have to be clear what that meant in 1936. Uh, today in Europe, if you say you're a socialist, it could mean almost anything. It probably means you're in favor of a bigger welfare state. Um, might not even mean that. Um, but in 1936, it meant something very definite. If you were a socialist, it meant that you were in favor of bringing the entire industrial assets of the country into government ownership. It meant that at the very least. Uh, it probably also meant that you were in favor of quality of income. It meant that you were in favor of abolishing the public schools the House of Lords, the monarchy, and a lot of things like that. So it was very, very definite. The, 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 the term socialism became diluted later. But in 1936, when Orwell was converted to socialism, it meant something very, very precise and definite. And everybody who called themselves a socialist more or less agreed upon this. Whether they were members of the Communist Party, members of the Independent Labour Party, the ILP, uh, all members of the Labour Party. Uh, they agreed on what socialism was. Now, um, I should explain that it, in, in Britain, just like in America, there is a two-party system. Uh, the two parties used to be the Liberals and the Conservatives. But then in the 1920s, the Liberals were replaced by the Labour Party. The Labour Party took the place of the, Liberal. the Liberals became a tiny party, and the Labour Party became the alternative to the Conservative Party. Now, the Labour Party is a trade union party. That's where it gets its money from, and that's where the whole impetus for its formation came from. In other words, if you're a member of a trade union in Britain, you pay your union dues, and a small percentage of that goes to the Labour Party. That's where the Labour Party uh, is funded. So, at this point in 1936, there have been two Labour governments in history, uh, but they've been minority governments, where a minority uh, Labour representation in Parliament had to be supported by Liberals in order to get anything through. The majority Labour government wasn't to come until 1945 after the war. And when the Labour government came in in 1945, uh, it immediately started nationalizing a lot of things. In fact, it national they nationalized in a few years 
uh, one-fifth of the British Thank economy. You. Yes, sir. Thank you. So this Thank was, you. up until that point, up until about 1950, everybody understood in Britain that this is what socialism meant. Now, <clears throat> in this book, The Road to Wigan Pier, uh, Orwell gives his uh, views about socialism. Uh, he is, of course, a new convert to socialism. And there are certain things he doesn't like about socialists. And so there are these famous passages in the Road to Wigan Pier where he attacks vegetarians, nudists, uh, fruit juice drinkers, people who wear shorts, um, people who wear sandals. Um, in other words, the nut jobs who he thought um, were infecting socialism and giving it a bad name. And he, this was one of his reasons for not being a socialist. And now he became, now he was a socialist, he, this was one of his reasons for saying that socialism isn't doing a good job of representing itself to the public because there are all these crackpots. Um, there were certain things Orwell never, um, no, let me put it differently. Orwell had certain attitudes. Uh, he did not like homosexuality. Um, he didn't like uh, people who drank fruit juice and ate nuts. He thought that liver and bacon was a good uh, sort of thing to eat. Um, and um, this comes through constantly throughout his life, the particular attitudes that he had. Now, the, it ended, the, the book, The Road to Wigan Pier, was actually published by the Left Book Club. And the Left Book Club, you actually used to see, um, when I first came to Chicago um, in the uh, early 1980s, you used to see Left Book Club books in used bookstores in Chicago. They were faded, they, and had, they had a sort of pinkish look about them. But you often saw them. Um, they, you know, so I gather that a lot of people in the United States uh, bought the products of the Left Book Club. The Left Book Club was the great achievement of the Communist Party to try and achieve some control over the British left. Um, and it occurred, if Tayday was in the period of what's known as the Popular Front Movement, uh, earlier, the Communist Party, uh, from, from let's say 1928 to 1934, the Communist Party had been opposed to any collaboration with non-communist socialists, reviewed them with great hostility. Uh, this was the class against class period, uh, that was called the third period, meaning that capitalism had entered a period where uh, it was ripe for a revolution, and the people who were preventing the revolution were the uh, lefties who actually supported capitalism. So the, the Communist Party from 1928 to 1934 was extremely hostile to other left-wing groups. I mean, even to the point of beating, up, beating them up and that sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> but then, beginning in 1934, the Communist Party started changing its attitude towards the rest of the left and started becoming more friendly. Uh, and this coincided with the interests of the Soviet government in trying to form an alliance with Western governments against the danger from Germany. <coughs> so, the Left Book Club was more than a book club in, in Britain. And the Left Book Club was a constant stream of meetings, of socials, of cycling clubs, of dances, of discussion groups. It was like a church. Uh, and um, Orwell, it's worth noting that Orwell uh, was quite pleased to be published in the Left Book Club. Uh, and in fact, The Road to Wigan Pier was one of the most successful books ever produced in the Left Book Club. Um, now, the Left Book Club was actually under the control of the Communist Party in, indirectly. The, the, the Left Book Club was, uh, was controlled by three people. Uh, Galantz, Victor Galantz, who was the head of the publishing company, Victor Galantz, um, John Strachey, and Harold Lasky. And all three of these were very reliable fellow travelers 
who did what the Communist Party, more or less what the Communist Party told them. Uh, but um, <clears throat> so the road, the road to Wigan Pier has some rather sour remarks about Russia and the Communist Party. But it basically is in favor of the popular front and basically views uh, the Communist Party as a healthy force to combat fascism. Now, so in 1936, Orwell wrote The Road to Wigan Pier. He then went to fight in Spain. The Spanish Civil War had begun. The Spanish Civil War went from 1936 to 1939. The Spanish Civil War was the biggest world event in the minds of the left of all time, no exceptions. It was a much bigger deal than the Vietnam War, much bigger deal. Uh, this was the war on which the fate of civilization hung. Uh, the war began when a general or group of generals um, started a rebellion against the popular front government of Spain. So the, uh, so the legitimate government of Spain, as it were, was the left-wing government. Uh, uh, and the, the generals who were right-wingers who were opposed to this, and who were ultimately, as it turned out, to be led by Franco, they were the rebels. And what happened at the, at the outbreak of the Spanish Civil War was that the rebels announced uh, a new government, the overthrow of the Republic. I'm going to need some of the print. You have water right beside you. Would you like something else besides water for um, you? Okay. you want and what you might have expected was that this would either succeed or fail. Either there would be a new right-wing government that had happened before, Pronunciamento, that happened before in Spanish history where a dictator had taken over, a right-wing dictator. Or the government would assert itself. But what actually happened was that about 50% of Spain came under the control of the right-wing rebels, and the other 50% was under the control of the Republicans who were the left wing government. <coughs> From then on, it was a war a bit like the First World War. That's to say, there was a front, there were trenches, people shot at each other. So Orwell went out to Spain he, as a writer or as a fighter. It wasn't initially very clear. Orwell did all sorts of things in his short life, but it's fair to say that a major motive for doing everything was to write about it, to have experiences and then write about those experiences. Now, Orwell tried to join up with the International Brigade, uh, which was the communist control uh, uh, group of international people, volunteers to go and fight for the left in Spain. Uh, but, but they wouldn't have it. So he ended up fighting for this um, POUM, uh, which was um, often called Trotsky, it's not strictly accurate. Corrine. But it was a Marxist group not controlled by Moscow, put it that way, not, and disliked intensely yeah. by the Communist Party. Now, in, in, in Spain, in the Civil War in Spain, the different political groupings had their own military forces, and they were responsible for different parts of the front. Uh, and the POUN, this little Marxist group that Orwell, who wasn't a Marxist, uh, ended up fighting for, was only real. It was, it was it had negligible following anywhere, but it, where it had some following was in Catalonia, which is the province in the southeast of Spain the biggest city being Barcelona. Um, and um, so Orwell fought for the PLUN. Uh, he was there for several months. Uh, his wife moved to Barcelona, got a job in Barcelona, 
so to see him occasionally. Then he was then he was shot in the throat. Um, but, you know, Orwell was a very tall person. He was about six and a half foot tall. Had very big hands, very big feet. It was always a problem to get shoes that were big enough. That kind of thing. And so his head was always very conspicuous. Very <laughs> stuck up. You could have you could argue that if he hadn't been so tall, it would have gone. The bullet would have gone through his head. But um, anyway, the bullet went through his throat. And his throat was in more or less the condition that mine is right now. Um, and Orwell was Could you get him some tea? became a hospital casualty. Speaker? Yeah. Yes. Uh, but then he started to recover. Uh, and then he, uh, he decided that he was going to um, he was going to get his papers and leave the Republican Army, leave the militia to be able to end. And they had a rule that you had to go back to the front to get your discharge papers, quite understandable, uh, because otherwise you would encourage desertion. So he went back to the front. And while at this point there occurred the communist suppression of the left throughout Spain. <coughs> communists and their allies in the right wing of the, of the Spanish Socialist Party um, locked up and tortured all the, all the leftists. Uh, and Orwell was very nearly a casualty of this. Uh, and um, he narrowly escaped uh, being arrested and no doubt tortured and killed. Uh, oh, yeah, okay. Thanks. Um, so, uh, when Orwell came back to England, uh, not meant only a year or so had passed, but he was now a great enemy of the Communist Party. The Communist Party, um, at this time, although they were cozying up to the left in general terms, were at the, it was at the peak of the anti trotskyist theory, where they were uh, going after Trotskyists, and they defined, and who was, they chose who was Trotskyist. But basically, anybody who criticized the Communist Party from the left was a Trotskyist. Uh, so, uh, from then on, from you see a different relationship between Orwell and the Communist Party. And uh, he becomes more critical of the Soviet Union and more critical of the Communist Party. From one, th there is one thing that leads to misunderstandings about Orwell, and that is that some people overlook the fact that at certain points he radically changed his views quite suddenly. Uh, and this is, this is particularly the case with regard to his attitude to a possible anti-fascist war. Um, From June 1937 until August 1939, Orwell was what the communists would call an ultra-leftist, and what many people call the pacifist, although it's not strictly accurate. He was very much opposed to the war that everybody knew was coming with Germany. Uh, and basically argued that they took the traditional leftist view that when there's a war, it's a war between capitalist powers. The workers have no country. They shouldn't get involved. They should, be, they should um, boycott the war. Sometimes called pacifism, but it's not pacifism because it's not opposed to physical violence against the capitalists. Uh, he's just opposed to physical violence by one country against another. Uh, but anyway, that's his, that was his position. Now, uh, he argued strenuously and repeatedly for this position, very in great detail, and it was a position that was shared by a lot of other people. There were a lot of the people on the left uh, in Britain who said, there were some people who said, Fascism is a great danger and we've got to fight it. 
but there were other people who said, no, that's just a trick. Just like in the First World War, we fought Prussian militarism. Uh, they're now asking us to fight fascism. It's just a trick. And Orwell was one of these. On the night of the 21st of August, according to Orwell's later account, on the night of the 21st of August, 1939, uh, Orwell had a dream. And in his recollections of this, he doesn't tell us what happened in this dream, except that in this dream, the war had started. And he woke up from this dream. And he said he knew when he woke up from this dream that he would fight for Britain in a war against Germany, even though he'd been arguing for over two years consistently uh, that there should be no such war. And in fact, had actually suggested to people that they should organize an underground resistance to sabotage this war when it came. Uh, on that, oh, this is literally an overnight conversion, if you believe, almost later account, uh, that he became a supporter of the war. And he said that he he woke up from his, from his dream Sorry. Uh, and knew that he would fight for Britain against Nazi Germany. He came downstairs and he saw the newspapers, and in the headline of the newspapers was Ribbentrop's visit to Moscow. In other words, in other words. Um, the pact of friendship between the Soviet Union and the Third Reich had begun. Okay. So, it's interesting that, that Orwell and the Communist Party changed their political positions in opposite ways at almost, on almost the same day. Up until then, the Communist Party had been militant for a war against Germany, but now suddenly became the Peace Party. and said, we must accept Hitler's peace terms. Uh, and Orwell moved in the opposite direction, having been saying, uh, oh, you know, don't be fooled by this anti-fascist talk, it's just a capitalist war. Um, he's now saying, um, yeah, we've got to fight. And, there's, and there is, in Orwell, I think, a slight satisfaction that now these two evil forces were aligned, of communism and national socialism. He's, uh, this, I think he slightly likes the idea that it simplified things, that they were united um, against democracy, or whatever you want to call it. Um, <clears throat> so then Orwell worked for the BBC during the war. He, tri he also he tried to join up, but they wouldn't have him for health reasons. His health was always terrible. Um, and um, that's why he died so young. Uh, <clears throat> He did join, he was an active member of the Home Guard, and the Home Guard was a, a citizen army that was, that all the people who couldn't join the regular army, or the Navy, or the Air Force, uh, uh, were organized into the Home Guard, who would make trouble for the Germans if they invaded, that was the idea. So all the old men, and the young boys, and people who had health problems, uh, they were all in the Home Guard, if they wanted to be they nearly all did. Um, so so um, Orwell was very very active and enthusiastic in, in, in the Home Guard. And um, his leftist position of opposition to the war, which ended on August 22nd, 1939, which of course was only a few days before the, action, the war actually broke broke out, because as soon as Hitler had secured his frontier by the alliance with Soviet Russia, he then invaded Poland, and so did Soviet Russia. This transition, I think, well, what happened with this transition was, this is, I, I was going to interpret it slightly, but I'll just give you the fact, that Orwell took the view in the early stages, or well, for some years into the war, that the only chance for winning the war was a socialist revolution in Britain. He repeatedly said uh, the capitalist class represented by people like Churchill cannot win this war. 
Uh, why can't they win this war? Well, because we're up against socialism in the, in the form of Nazi Germany, and that's more efficient. And every time they had uh, a military victory, which of course in those early days they often did uh, for the Germans, uh, Orwell would say, see, this shows, this is a more efficient way uh, to run society, and that's why they're beating us militarily. So the only hope to win the war is to have a socialist revolution in Britain. And he said at one point, I don't care if the gutters run with blood, um, we need a socialist revolution, and then we can win the war against Germany. Now, this was quite a popular view at the time. Uh, not in such uh, extreme terms, but it was a very popular view that you couldn't, Britain couldn't hope to win the war without some kind of radical reforms. J.B. Priestley, the popular novelist, uh, gave talks all through the war, radio talks, uh, and he put this line. So, I, as with many things, we tend to think Orwell's I isolated. But actually, Orwell was never isolated. He was always representing a point of view that was fairly standard uh, on the left in Britain. Um, when Orwell saw that the war was won, or believed that the war was won, and I quite rightly saw that the war, the war was won, although a lot of people had yet to catch up with him on that, uh, he resigned from the BBC. Uh, and got a job as literary editor of Tribune, which is the left wing of the Labour Party um, newspaper, uh, and um, wrote a lot for that paper, uh, and also worked on his uh, next book, which was Animal Farm. Um, <clears throat> so that's a few things about Orwell, and of course you know what happened then. Animal Farm eventually was published. It was a huge success. Uh, Orwell had been poor all his life, uh, he suddenly became rich, or would have done but for the uh, Labour government's um, taxation policy at the end of the war. Uh, and then Orwell was what you might call a glutton for punishment. Um, uh, here's a guy who's had tuberculosis all his life, and he's constantly being told to go to warm, dry climates. So he decides to go and live in this ram ramshackle cottage on, on a western Scottish island. And he went and lived in order to finish off his book 1984. So that's where he finished off his book 1984, and it finished off him too. Um, and he came back and then he spent the rest of his life in a sanitarium. Uh, uh, they wouldn't even, they took his typewriter away. His health was so delicate they wouldn't let him do any work. Uh, and um, he didn't write much. Uh, he was exhausted all the time, sick. Uh, and 1984 came out in uh, he wrote it in 1948. Some people think there's significance in that, 48, 84, but that's a debate. Um, uh, it came out in 1949. <coughs> it was an even bigger success. Uh, Orwell was uh, upset to see that people thought of it as anti socialist. Why would it be anti socialist? Um, and um, he said it he wasn't anti socialist. He supported the Labour government. He wished it just wish they were more left wing. Uh, and he died in January uh, 1952. So that's a bit about the life of the world. Um, I, want to, I want to just finish up, and I'm not going to talk very much longer because my voice is giving out, uh, by talking about totalitarianism. Um, I think one thing you have to understand about, the, about Orwell's time is that the 1920s and 1930s were a period where it looked as though uh, democracy, capitalism, and freedom were all disappearing. That was the trend. Um, somewhere I've got a list. Just in Europe, uh, which um, this was also a period where Europe was still the center of the world. After the Second World War, you have a new kind of arena where it's the United States against Soviet Russia, and Europe is, becomes a bit marginalized. But until the Second World War, to most literate people in Western cultures, it was assumed that Europe was the most important part of the world, where things got decided. Well, 
uh, ju just to, to jot down the European examples of countries that moved from democracy to dictatorship. <coughs> Russia in 1970. Italy, Lithuania, and Poland. Not that there's any connection between those three, but it's just a coincidence. But in 1926, uh, Italy, Mussolini had been made prime minister in 1922. This took a while before he became a dictator. Um, Albania in 1928. Yugoslavia in 1929. Portugal in stages, becoming more and more like a dictatorship, culminating in 1933. Germany and Austria, independently, they weren't yet united, uh, completely independent development, became dictatorships in 1933. Latvia and Bulgaria in 1934. Estonia in 1935. Spain in stages in 1936 to 1939. So those are all examples of countries that had been democracies <coughs> becoming dictatorships. Uh, Romania was a monarchy with some democratic elements which gradually became more and more like a more and more repressive dictatorship throughout that period. And that's, not, that's just Europe. I mean, there were other things going on in the world. But perhaps one of the biggest was the Mexican Revolution, 1910 to 1917, which ended up with effectively, although not officially, a one-party state. Um, so, to journalists and intellectuals looking at the world in the 1920s and 1930s, uh, leaving aside whether you like this or not, whether you think it's a good thing or a bad thing, um, what you see is notions like free speech, freedom of assembly, uh, Pluralism in the sense of numerous competing points of view. These are all being eclipsed, they're being abolished in one country after another. It looks like an ominous trend that has no limit. Uh, capitalism, free market capitalism, looks as though it's disappearing. Many of these countries were placing severe restrictions on capitalism. Of course, in Soviet Russia, they abolished capitalism, arguably. Um, in Germany, under the Nazis, capitalism was more and more subject to um, regulation and planning so that the, the businessmen became, in effect, officials of the state. Trade unionism was abolished in these countries, all Soviet Russia, Nazi Germany, um, fascist Italy. You know, Mussolini made the trains run on time. He made the trains run on time by smashing the railroad unions. It's easy enough to do that. The trains would run on time. Um, so you've got this. You've got this picture, of which um, some people welcome. This is a brave new world. It's the end of all these liberal uh, myths and uh, and uh, and so on. But some people and some people didn't welcome and thought it was hor horrifying. But you've got this definite picture in that period of the world moving from democracy to dictatorship and, and uh, from um, free market capitalism to heavily regulated capitalism, if not socialism. Uh, and from ideas like free speech, freedom of conscience, freedom of worship, these things are being, uh, being obliterated. So, in this environment, the notion of totalitarianism develops. Uh, and again, this is one of these things where people make a mistake. Um, totalitarianism is is something that stems, the word, the concept, stems from the early 1920s. It was originally used by liberal critics of, of fascists in Italy. But then the fascist movement in Italy adopted the term. They said, yeah, this is great, we're totalitarians. Uh, and uh, Mussolini started making speeches where he used this totalitarian term. And then what happened was it was used by different people in different ways. There was a group of people who used the word totalitarian, and what they meant was that they could see that there was a great similarity between Nazi Germany and Soviet Russia. People who, people who visited um, those two countries uh, in 1934, 1935, 1936, Soviet Russia and Nazi Germany, were struck by the similarities. I mean, 
they commented on the differences. Everything was much cleaner in Germany, that sort of thing. Uh, but, but, super, but those superficial things aside, uh, there was a great leader whose picture was everywhere. There was a one-party state. Um, ordinary people were afraid to talk to foreigners. The children were organized to inform on their parents and tell the police about suspicious things their parents were doing. There were lots and lots of similarities in these two, um, in these two societies. And this uh, sustained this notion of totalitarianism. There's no uniformity in how it's used. It's a very complex development. <coughs> the, the meaning of the word totalitarianism and people who refused to use it who were people who used it for the Nazis and fascists but not for Soviet Russia and so on I mean, different people had different ways of using this term but it was a well established term uh, and Orwell used this term Orwell generally was old fashioned in many ways and did dislike no novel uh, but this is one term he did adopt he used it occasionally from 1936 to 1937 but after that 1938, 1939, especially 1940, he starts to use it a lot. And he starts to say, what I'm against is totalitarianism. Now, I think, I can, I think I'll summarize what Orwell thought rather than, and I can substantiate all these things, uh, but I will just summarize what I think was the gist of Orwell's attitude and how it changed. But first of all, let me say this. When you read about the attitude of the left in the 1930s, the left believed in two things, and it's important to distinguish them. They're not the same thing. First of all, they believed that socialism would be better than capitalism, and they wanted socialism. That's one thing. Now, the second thing sounds very similar, but it's not. They believed that, irrespective of what anybody wanted, capitalism was doomed that was give, going to give way to socialism. See, those are two different positions. And the left believed in both of them. Now, <clears throat> Orwell, um, <clears throat> when he became a socialist in 1936, and by the way, when Orwell became a socialist, he also became obsessed with politics. Up until 1936, he sees himself primarily as a novelist. He's a great admirer of George Gissing, and he sees himself as the new Gissing. Um, <clears throat> and he sees himself as not being primarily a political person. When, he when he's converted to socialism in the middle of 1936, uh, He's also converted to the view of himself as primarily political. But all that matters is politics. He doesn't write anything after that that isn't really about politics. Even when he writes uh, an essay about the first day of spring, and he says he, how much he enjoys watching two toads mating, he can't stop himself from saying in the next sentence, as I watch these two toads mating, I can't help thinking about all the powerful people who would want to stop me doing watching them and enjoying this spectacle. See, so it's all political, everything about it. And one of the consequences of this is, from someone like me who's trying to analyze Orwell's thinking, is that his, his thinking on politics before 1936 is rather obscure. You don't know exactly what he thought, because he's really not all that. He's an artist, he's a writer, primarily, and not much interested in politics. In 1936, he's both a socialist and obsessed with politics. Now, Orwell, when he became a socialist, uh, and you see it in the second half of the road to Wien um, he accepted these two propositions that all the left accepted. Socialism ought to replace capital. And socialism is certain to replace capital. And this is one thing that Orwell keeps on reiterating throughout his uh, career as a writer, is that capitalism is finished, objectively, regardless of what anybody thinks regardless of whether we like it or not. Capitalism has no future, it's finished. It keeps on saying this over and over again. And he believe, obviously believed it. Um, so those two things. Now, by 1939, we can say that Orwell's position has evolved. 
Remember those two things. Socialism ought to replace capitalism. Socialism is certain to replace capitalism. By 1939, you have a somewhat different view. And this view goes as follows. And I'm, this is my words, but it's what Orwell believed. Socialism, which is the kind of collectivism we would like to see, ought to replace capitalism. This is, this is going to be four propositions instead of two. Number two, some type of collectivism is certain to replace capitalism. Number three, collectivism may be democratic, in which case it's socialism and it's wonderful and we want it, or it may be oligarchical, in which case it's brutal and totalitarian and we don't want it. Proposition number four, democratic collectivism, that's to say what all of call socialism, would be much, much better than capitalism, but oligarchical collectivism or totalitarianism is much worse than capitalism. And notice I don't say would be, but is, because we could see oligarchical collectivism in Nazi Germany and Soviet Russia. Um, and then there is a fifth proposition which gradually looms larger, and that is, it may very well be, unfortunately, that democratic collectivism is impossible. And therefore, given that we, given that we know that capitalism has no future, right, we know that, um, oligarchical collectivism, totalitarianism, the new slave state, is the future whether we like it or not. And it's with that conclusion that Orwell set out to write 1984. Time for questions. All right, thank you ready for questions. I got the first one, Brom. Um, well, Yes. Uh, Tell me what you think. So. <laughs> Tell me, did did uh, George Orwell ever read that other? You talk about the road to Wikipedia. Did Orwell ever read the road to serfdom? Yeah, I can answer both those questions. Um, by the way, um, just as a footnote here. Wigan is a town in Lancashire, and um, the title, The Road to Wigan Theatre, is a kind of a joke on several levels. Uh, Rudyard Kipling, who was a, um, a poet who was read by every middle class literate person in England, uh, it had an influence on several generations of middle class literate people that is difficult to imagine today, especially difficult to imagine for a poet. Um, <clears throat> Rudyard Kipling wrote a poem called The Road to Mandalay. Orwell came from Mandalay in Burma to Wigan in Lancashire to write The Road to Wigan Theatre. Uh, not only did Kipling write The Road to Mandalay, it, became, it was then set to music, and it became a music hall hit. Uh, footnote, where Americans say vaudeville, Brits say musical. They mean the same thing. Brits say what? Musical. Vaudeville means, in Britain, British English, it is musical. Um, <clears throat> So it was a huge musical hit, The Road to Mandalay. Um, everybody just knew every line of that poem. And actually, Rudyard Kipling was a brilliant person who knew a bit about India. He didn't know much about Mandalay, and there were several mistakes in it. But um, that's just the way. Um, it's still a terrific popular poem. Um, so, so in the title, The Road to Wigan Pier, uh, there is that joke. There is also the fact that Wigan is this, at that time, was this rather, um, 
shabby and run-down town with no great glamour attached to it. Uh, and a pier in Britain is like boardwalk in America. It's like a sort of um, glamorous place where people go to be entertained. But the Wigan Pier, which had been torn down long before Orwell got to Wigan, was a, a little jetty to unload, unload coal, coal barges. Um, so that's part of the joke as well. Uh, so, um, In 1944, uh, Friedrich Hayek wrote the road, or published The Road to Serfdom, and Orwell reviewed it. Uh, and he reviewed it. And one of the things that one of the things where I differ from nearly everybody who writes about Orwell is that most people are taken in by Orwell's air of candor, and they think he was an unusually honest and forthright person. Now, I don't think Orwell was an unusually dishonest person, but, he, but I think he was a very crafty person. And I think he carefully calculated the impression he would make with every phrase he used as a persuasive writer. Orwell never blurted out. It, Orwell reminds me of Michael Corleone. Don't let them know what you're thinking. Um, it doesn't mean he's saying things he doesn't believe. It just means he's selecting things that he believes for their maximum impact on a certain region. That's my view of Orwell. He's very, very canny and very cunning. Um, so he wrote this review of uh, The Road to Serpent. He reviewed it jointly with a book by a communist fellow traveler whose name is Connie Ziliakis. Um, I forget what the, what the title of that book was actually, but he reviewed these two things together. And he said, well, one of these is against laissez-faire capitalism and the other is in favor of it. And isn't it interesting that they're both very depressing books and that's at the tone of the, <laughs> that's the, tone of the review. Um, I think that somebody reading, I think he did as much to promote Hayek's Road to Serfdom in that review as he could have done and got away with it. I think, I think Orwell was always trying to say to his readership, look, I'm a man of the left just like you. And I'm going to say some things that will shock you, but don't let, don't for a moment think that I'm right wing. Um, that's that's part of Orwell's uh, the under uh, under under the, between the lines. The uh, it's part of the uh, un, unspoken message. Uh, so I mean, basically, he, he gives a it's a fair his discussion of it's brief, it's fair, um, and it does see what what Hayek's getting. I personally think that Hayek's book, The Road to Serfdom, is uh, one of the most brilliant analyses of totalitarianism. Um, and of course, part of the reason is that he does say that, it, that totalitarianism flows naturally from socialism. I mean, that's what many people analyzed totalitarianism and thought that it's just a free floating sort of evil thing. Uh, but uh, Hayek makes a good case that um, if you try to run the economy as a, with a single plan instead of allowing competition and allowing people to try out different things in their own way, uh, you're going to end up with totalitarianism. So that's, well, I, that's what I personally think. Uh, and it's interesting actually that Hayek quotes a lot of people who have written about totalitarianism in the book The Road to Circle, and they're very much there's a huge overlap between the people he cites and the people all our cites when he talks about them. You know, they'd, they were all, they'd all read Trotsky, they'd all read Ignacio Silone, they'd all read Balkan, um, you know, they'd all, they'd all read all these people who laid the groundwork for our understanding of totalitarianism. <coughs> next, hey, Bram, next questioner. Uh, yeah, if I understand you right, you had uh, mentioned some time ago uh, that there was some belief on the part of uh, socialists and others that it would have been nearly impossible to have any kind of democratic collectivism 
and yet during World War II, in this country and others, uh, was there not a certain amount of just that? Uh, democratic collectivism, uh, yes, you were overseeing, the government oversaw a lot of activities, but there was the option if you didn't like the regime. I mean, you did have the opportunity to vote FDR out, and he at various times was afraid that was going to happen to him. Uh, wasn't uh, what we closed at at one point? Well, this, this is an interesting, um, this is an interesting um, line of thought. Um, I mean, Orwell all, all certainly was, let's say, was afraid that economic planning would have to lead to totalitarianism. He was hoping that that wouldn't be true, uh, but he was afraid of that. Hayek thought that it was true and argued strongly that it was true. Um, I'm convinced that it is true, uh, and I've often met objections to it, but I've never met this one. This is a new one, because I've always considered that um, the capitalist system was pretty firmly rooted, even in second, being under the wartime regime in the United States. So I haven't really thought about whether that's an, uh, a counter instance. Um, I mean, I mean the thing. The thing you have to understand yeah, is, cool as, a, right as a background to this, is that New Deal type capitalism is departure from laissez faire, but, it's, but it certainly isn't social. It certainly isn't collectivism as it would have been understood by 1930s intellectual subject order. Uh, similarly, the kind of um, the kind of uh, economic policies we've had in, in Scandinavian countries uh, since the Second World War. Um, that 1930s leftists would have had no hesitation in saying, well, it's capitalism with a few modifications. And I think they're right. I think they're right. Um, and that's what I think, that would be my first reaction to this suggestion about um, Second World War um, uh, United States. And yet have we all heard capitalists uh, who remember that period uh, say that uh, it was uh, to turn the table around, uh, socialism with a few modifications. Yeah, I mean, I think. Look, I think the term socialism is very ambiguous. And it's been used in lots of different ways, and I think that, um, especially in the United States, where things that would be considered not socialist would never have been considered socialism in Europe are, are sometimes described as socialism here, like. The, Tennessee Valley Authority or something like that. Um, but I think it's, this, this contrast in the different meanings of the term socialism is even clearer uh, if you look at the 1930s compared to the world. Because, um, see, my, my view is, uh, my broad view of this is that since the 1930s, the left has moved steadily to the right may not seem that way superficially from one year to the next. The left has moved steadily to the right. Uh, and the, the thing that first made me think yeah. about this and notice it was when I read uh, Harold Macmillan's book, The Middle Way, which was published around 1938. And he was on the left wing of the Conservative Party in Britain. And he laid down a strategy for um, industrial development. And it, I read that book in the 1970s and it struck me that if anybody had put forward these measures in the 1970s, they would have been regarded as a far leftist. Um, whereas in 1938 it was considered socially responsible conservatism. So I see um, a succession of retreats by the left from their view that they held in the 1930s. Uh, that um, the troubles of the world could be abolished by nationalizing it. Uh, and they, they, you know, you see it in every country in the world, I think. There's been a retreat, or every Western country, anyway. There's been a retreat from this. Uh, you mentioned that uh, George Orwell's father was a uh, houseman or something. 
Sit this up. Uh, <laughs> then am I to understand that uh, George Orwell was half Indian and half English? Oh no, no, um, no. Um, the the uh, very few British the administrative, very few of the of the administrative class in India married Indians. They married English girls. But what happened very often was that the English, their brides, didn't stay with them for long and went back to England. And they would visit their brides about once every two years at most. They're uh, No, the, um, actually, um, Orwell, on his mother's side, was predominantly French. Uh, her, her family name was uh, Imuza. Um, and, um, and they had holdings of tea plantations in Burma. And Orwell always maintained that uh, people like that were exploiting the colonies, and it was why, that was why we had high living standards in Europe. It was completely wrong in my opinion, but that was what Orwell thought. Um, so um, Orwell's background is interesting because he didn't, he, he makes lots of nasty remarks about Scots, but Blair is a Scottish name, of course. Um, so maybe what you No. Are you familiar with a book I've been heard symbol called Imperialism and Social and uh, Social Reform? And uh, are you at all familiar with the Fabian Society? Uh, I'm very familiar with the Fabian Society. Uh, the, the book you mentioned I haven't read. among his friends was known as Boar, you know, meaning nigger. Uh, so, um, because he was so dark. Uh, so, um, and he used the term himself about other people, like Masala. But, uh, but um, uh, Orwell, some writers about Orwell claim that he was very well versed in Marxism. I don't think he was. I think he knew very little about Marxism. I mean, what he knew, but the, I'll, I'll slightly take that back. Um, <clears throat> What he knew was what, and what he took to be Marxism, was what the Communist Party and their fellow travelers were saying in the 1930s. Now that's a little bit of Marxism somewhat distorted in my opinion. It's not Marxism. It's not the whole of Marxism. Uh, the, the, the classic book, which made a huge impact, a very well written book, I really admire the way it's written and it's very persuasive, is The Coming Struggle for Power by John Street. Which was, which was um, strange. He never joined the Communist Party, uh, but he, for many years, he preached the Communist line, and he did so with um, with verve and um, eloquence that nobody in the Communist Party could match. And that was the, the real that, that really crystallizes the, the Communist Party view of the world in the mid 1930s, the, the coming struggle for power. Now Orwell was thoroughly acquainted with that line thoroughly acquainted with what Strachey was saying, that sort of thing, and what the Communist Party was saying uh, from one year to the next. And he was aware of the fact, which many people wouldn't have been aware, that the Communist Party had had this big change in its attitude to the left uh, around 1934, that it had changed from the class against class to the popular front. Um, so Orwell knew, Orwell, Orwell knew what, what a, a journalist with his wits about him would know. But, for, but Orwell wasn't the kind of person who would go and crack the books and, and do what I did when I was a kid, which was to work my way through uh, volume, volumes one, two, and three of Capital. 
uh, underlining every bit that I didn't understand and then go back and do it again. Uh, that's not something Orwell would ever do. And that explains why we thought No, I don't think that's it. Okay, I don't think it. sorry, I think honey. That, I think that what happened was this. Um, you by yourself? Orwell uh, was at, uh, there are certain things about, that, about Orwell's outlook on the world that never change. And one of them is capitalism is doomed, but it has to end. Not because we want it to, but just it's an absolute, it's like the edict of history. It, it just has to, because it's, capitalism is so inefficient and socialism will be so much more efficient. So that that was his view. So he never he never really challenged that view. Now, um, I think that what happened was that he, he observed he observed Soviet Russia. What you have to understand, what a lot of people again, I'm always saying this, a lot of people don't understand. Um, <coughs> a lot of people don't understand that a very large segment of the land was very anti communist um, and um, an example of this would be 1920, Bertrand Russell, who was an extremely influential left-wing thinker at that time, wrote a book called The Theory and Practice of Bolshevism. After he visited Soviet Russia, he didn't just, he didn't just look around and write a book. He studied Soviet Russia for a bit. But he'd earlier written a book about German social democracy. So he knew quite a bit. Uh, and that book is one of the few books about Soviet Russia, written about 1920, that you could read today and not find any serious fault. Uh, and he was damning in his, uh, he'd been sympathetic to the Bolshevik Revolution before then, but he was damning in his, um, in his uh, criticism of it. Uh, and there were, so there was a very large element of the British left uh, who were very anti-communist. And, and, uh, and of course, when the, when the communists were consolidating their power, who did they bump off? It was uh, it was the uh, it was the social democrats, it was the Marxists. Uh, so um, and of course also they shut down the trade unions. So all of these things would not have been dear to leftists in Britain. No, I think that I think that what happened was that Orwell started thinking about what socialism would have to do in order. To, remember, we're talking about replacing private ownership of industry with a state ownership, which is central. Land, where there was a single vast plan, as I would say, uh, that governs all of uh, the economic life. And it, it doesn't take much thought to see that that's dictatorial in its essence. It has to be dictatorial. Um, and um, I think Orwell saw that. Uh, and I think he, he held out the hope that it, what he says on a number of occasions is he does not. We've not seen this tried in a country with a tradition of free speech like England. Uh, and if we do, maybe it will turn out differently. So that was his, he just hoped. But he had, he had good reasons for thinking that like socialism would lead to some All right. No, hey, Anderson. Uh, Mike Flores, Dave Zucker, and then Charlie Pita. That's all we'll have time for then, because it's getting to be after the those four. We'll probably should get into rebuttals. I have a question. Um, in all your vast studies of uh, Orwell and uh, the works that he produced, can you give us a short, uh, like an idea of what are the best uh, points that Orwell made? What can we do to use that knowledge? to help move America forward and produce a better uh, life for Americans today. How does what Orwell wrote about pertain to what we can do today? Can you uh, give us any kind of brief thought on that? Um, well, since I think that Orwell was largely mistaken um, in his uh, political thinking, um, I'm not sure I can, but what, what I can say is this. Um, Orwell wrote some really wonderful books. Um, uh, as well as 1984 and Animal Farm, which everybody's read. Um, he also wrote Burmese Days, which is a great novel about the uh, British Empire. It's probably uh, second only to Passage to India by E. F. Fawcett as a novel about the, uh, the British Empire. Um, he, he wrote some novels that were not very good, like um, A Clergyman's Daughter, and they're not worth reading unless you're interested in them. The 
specifically interested in all of them. Uh, but he wrote one that's extremely good uh, called um, Coming Up for Air. Uh, <clears throat> then the second half of the Road to Wigan Theory is worth reading uh, because it tells you what a socialist in 1936 was thinking, or a particular kind of socialist in 1936 was thinking. Um, then he wrote his book about the Spanish Civil War, and homage to Catalonia, uh, which when it was produced, no, it was a flop, nobody bought it, but is now by far the uh, biggest selling non-fiction account. The, the biggest selling would be the Hemingway novel about, about the, uh, uh, for whom the bell tolls, about the um, Spanish Civil War, but the, uh, by far the best selling week by week today book about the Spanish Civil War is on homage to Catalonia by George Orwell. Um, so those are the things I think are his great achievements. I mean, I, and I think he was a, he was uh, a brilliant writer of persuasive prose, uh, and particularly when you realise that most of the things he wrote, he had no time to second guess. He just took it, well, manual typewriter, just typed them out and sent them off. That was it. You know, kept a carbon copy. Um, and um, uh, today, of course, you go through it 20 times, second guess yourself, because you can do it easily with the word processor. But in those days, that wasn't possible, and he couldn't afford it. He, he lived by his writing, so that's what he had to do. So I think that many of these, many of these short pieces that he wrote uh, are really his greatest achievement, uh, these essays and reviews. Um, <clears throat> I don't know that uh, Orwell had any great uh, truth to tell us about politics. I, don't, I mean, I, I think that um, Orwell is somebody who, because he was a brilliant writer, posed certain questions very starkly. But they were questions that other people were posing less starkly. I mean, they were questions that... Um, and Orwell, of course, Orwell, at the end of his life, Orwell wrote quite a bit about what he thought was coming. And he got some things right, but some things quite wrong. <coughs> um, he never expected to see economic prosperity. Uh, he, he thought there would be a slump after the Second World War, just like most people did. Um, and um, by the way, Orwell was the first, the first person that's ever been found, and therefore they think he originated to use the word Cold War. Um, and, um, you know, he did predict that, that, that uh, there would be this long drawn out standoff between um, the Soviet Union and the United States. Uh, and he did say, despite what many people tell you, that if, that if it came to it, Britain had to support the United States in the stand on. Um, but, yeah, I don't, I don't think he had great positive truths about politics to teach us. Next. Uh, let's see, David. My question is this. Speak um, up, Dave. Would you, would you care to comment on how certain disturbances, economic disturbances, um, I'm not sure that that's an accurate picture of what happened. Uh, you have to remember that um, Appeasement as, a, as um, a policy practiced by the Chamberlain government was a policy of fairly rapid rearmament. Um, the general view in Whitehall, Whitehall is the uh, part of Britain where all the tops and all hang out, um, part, of, part of London where all the uh, think, we would now say the think tank, the, the, the influential think tanks are located. Um, in Whitehall, the, the view was that Britain would be ready to fight a war with Germany by 1941. Uh, and that, um, and so rearmament was begun, British rearmament was very rapid. I mean, the, the Spitfire, something that was just as good as the, as the Bechersmith, that wasn't invented in six weeks. That was authorized by Chamberlain. Um, and um, so, the, you know, the, basically, and that's part of the appeasement policy, was prepare for war. And look, look, Let's try and put it off till 1941. Um, but the other thing was that um, after the First World War, 
there was a growing feeling, or it didn't come immediately, but later, after about 1928, you get this great uh, idea that the whole First World War would be totally unnecessary. And we, whatever we do, we must never repeat anything like that. And the way, and it seemed to people then, that uh, the way we prevent anything like that from happening again is by disarming. Because what obviously happened in 1914 was that all these countries in Europe were up armed and linked by alliances. Um, and uh, it, it was like a tripwire situation where something was going on. Uh, and so people in, in the late 20s began to think, um, you know, let's avoid that happening at all costs. So that, so that, and at the same time, there was the feeling, very widespread feeling, that Germany had been sadly mistreated at the Treaty of, the Treaty of Versailles, that, uh, that this was very unfair, and that many of the territories which were populated by Germans that had been taken from Germany and given to other countries should be returned to Germany. So, you know, Hitler's um, foreign policy until 1938 had general support in, in its objectives, not in its methods, but it's, in its objectives. Most thinking liberal people in, in Europe thought, yeah, that's right, Danzig should go back to Germany, Memel should go back to Germany. So that, that was, so there was that feeling that, now where things turn, uh, I think, in British attitudes and attitudes in other countries, was the Munich, people in Britain saw the Munich Agreement as the last desperate attempt to avert war. They, they, and, they, and they basically thought, if this doesn't work, it means war. Um, Hitler, of course, thought, oh, I've done it again. <laughs> um, I've, I've again got what I wanted by bluster and threats. Uh, but of course, the people in Britain didn't think like that. People at the highest level of government in Britain thought, well, this is it. This is, we've gone as far as we possibly can at the expense of checks, of course, um, uh, to okay, <laughs> um, and, um, it, so that, therefore, to compensate for that, they gave the guarantee to Poland. So I, I, don't, I don't think there were evil, um, evil um, appeasements. I think appeasement was partly a matter of giving back to Germany what they thought was wrong for the take from Germany. <clears throat> Just like a lot of people now think that the Russian occupied <laughs> lands of East Ukraine should go back to Russia, because they're obviously Russian. Uh, people felt that. Um, and. Uh, um, uh, but it was also partly this, uh, this idea of putting off war, putting off the war until uh, as long as possible. Um, so so that, that's my reading of the situation. I don't think back. there was ever a period where the British ruling class, in Thank however you, you define that, was um, particularly Thank sympathetic you. to national soldiers. I don't think that ever happened. I think they, they were always aghast at this spectacle. They might, they might at the most they would have thought was, uh, well, maybe he'll make war on Russia, and we won't get involved, and they, those two can slow it down. Um, but uh, very few people uh, in, in Britain had any direct sympathy with the um, with, um, right. Well, in the end, uh, and that's it. I haven't had, had, had a question. I ain't had one. My hands are. I know you've had your hands up. Well, thank you. We're running out of time. Well, Dan, cut it off with. Save it for the rebuttal. And he has the rebuttal after you, so. Okay, Charlie. All right. Pat had his hand up. Well, Pat didn't ask two or three questions already. Oh, he had one or two. Big deal. All right. Um, what's your name? Um, David. David. Uh, I don't know how to get around this. When they had nationalized railroads in your homeland, they were the envy of the world. You would call it a totalitarian, a government regulated system. Uh, when they privatized it, it became the laughing stock of the transportation community of the world. When they privatized the public transit system of London, it became, it is, it's termed the greatest transportation fiasco of all time. I sort of got the notion that you don't like nationalization 
or you equate it with totalitarianism, but it seemed to work very well in your homeland. Got a question? Yeah. <laughs> um, actually, when I was a little kid, I really loved the railroads and railways. I used to think they were great. I, going on a train journey was, was wonderful. <coughs> the reason it was so wonderful was because the trains were always empty. <laughs> this, this vast empty train shunting up between two villages, you know, endlessly um, at the taxpayers' expense. Um, uh, to me, as a kid, it was wonderful. Uh, and from the point of view of um, the uh, social product or the national income, uh, it was pretty disastrous. Um, and. Um, I think it was, uh, you know, what happened was they eventually decided to trim down the uh, the, uh, the nationalized um, railways that were costing the taxpayers a lot of money to keep shunting a, a handful of kids like me from one village to another. Uh, and uh, so, uh, you know, that, that happened a long time ago and people didn't like it. Um, it's very recently that, uh, that it's been denationalized. Um, by the way, I don't think that piecemeal nationalization automatically leads to totalitarianism. I don't like it, but I would never say that just because the government nationalizes one particular industry that's going to be totalitarian. Uh, what I think does lead to totalitarianism is the government controlling the whole of industry. That, I think, is likely to lead to totalitarianism. Mike? Okay, I got uh, two questions. I'll make them quick. First off, I had always heard, and I, I'm afraid to find out it's an urban legend, that George Orwell, when he turned his book idea into his agent, said he wanted to call it 1948. And Should the agent said, that? no, Thank you can't you. do that, and changed it to 1984. Mm -hmm. My yes. second question is, at what point did Orwell begin turning in reports on socialists that he knew the government? That's an inter they're both interesting questions. Um, uh, the first thing is it is an urban legend. Uh, or that Orwell never wanted to call it 1948. Uh, there, were, there were periods when he wanted to call it, there was a period when he wanted to call it the last man in Europe. Pretty bad title, but that, at one point that, that was, um, uh, but he never wanted to call it 1948. Um, and um, he might have taken pleasure in the fact that he was reversing the However, in some of the preparatory materials for 1984, there is the backstory of what happened, what, how we got from the way Britain was in 1948 to, to the Britain or Estrip 1 of 1984 is filled in. And basically, uh, basically, the left wing of the Labour Party becomes anti Semitic, uh, and a guy called Baker becomes a demagogue. Um, and, um, it leads to a totalitarian movement. And, it, you know, the ruling party is Ingsoc, which means English Socialism. Um, and my point is this. He, he had worked out the timing of when these things would occur. And it led him to 1984 as the earliest feasible date where he could have such a complete um, uh, transformation to the Britain. Um, now the other question, that's an interesting question about this, um, about the list. Uh, for those who don't know, Orwell um, <coughs> made a list of people who were communists, communist sympathizers, or s speculating might be communists or communist sympathizers. And um, he ended up giving this list, or they originally prepared it for his own satisfaction, apparently without any um, other motivation. Uh, he eventually gave it to um, a branch of the government, which was a, a secret branch of the government concerned with combating communist influence. Um, I forget the name of that branch of the government right now, but it was secret, so it was probably good for that. Um, anyway, um, one of his old flames, one of his old girlfriends, worked for this work for this brand. Her, Celia Kerwin. You do want and, um, more tea, right? Uh, no. Uh, sure? She heard yeah. that Orwell had got such a list, and she asked him for it, and he, he gave it to her. Um, in the collected works of George Orwell, in 20 volumes, 
uh, they publish the list with some missing because the people are still alive. Um, and, and it's got Orwell's comments, and he'll say, um, uh, this man may be a may be a communist, but I don't doubt if he's got the brains to be a communist. He'll say things like that. <laughs> or um, uh, this, this man is, seems to be a homosexual, and he wants to be watched, because we all know that com homosexual fight become communists. Um, uh, that, uh, that's what I'm saying. That, that's, that's not what all of us are. But you know, so he did compile this list. Um, and um, I mean, what amuses me about this is that some of the people who, you see, one of the paradoxes about Orwell is that the great majority of people who are interested in Orwell are left-wingers who like Orwell. Now, there are right-wingers who like Orwell, and there are left-wingers who dislike Orwell. Raymond Williams would be one. That's no um, but most people who write about Orwell are left-wingers who like Orwell. Uh, and what, what amuses me about this is the way uh, most of these left-wingers regard McCarthyism as being a terrible thing. Uh, because we all know there were no company spies in the U.S. It was just made up by McCarthy. Um, and um, so uh, they, want to, they want to find an argument to go on denouncing McCarthy um, while defending George Orwell. And Christopher Hitch, the late Christopher Hitchens did this. Uh, Christopher Hitchens was always making nasty remarks about Julia uh, Kazan and people like that, you know. Um, but, uh, but he... He defended, he was a big admirer of Orwell, and he defends Orwell on this list. Well, I think, to me, it, the, um, it's easier to defend McCarthy's list than it is to defend Orwell's list, um, I would say. Because McCarthy, McCar the list that McCarthy had was a list of people who had actually been identified as security risks. Um, and um, uh, whereas... Uh, the people on the list, uh, the Orwell's list, were just people he had speculations about. He was using his intuition to figure out what these people were. Uh, so, and he was, and furthermore, he was he was giving this to a branch of the government with the specific intention that these people would be discriminated against. Don't let these people have sensitive jobs in the government. You, this is this is something you see that you have to understand. The Labour government that came in in 1945 was extremely anti-communist. This was the government that authorized not only NATO, joining NATO, but the British independent deterrent, meaning the British AIBOM, right? They fought the communists in Malaya. Uh, they did all kinds of things uh, that were extremely... Um, they were, the, the, the policy of the Labour government, 1945 to 1950, uh, or in effect to 1951, um, was not really different towards communism than a conservative government would be. If anything, if anything, it was more militant in its anti-communism. Okay, Dave. At this yeah. point, we're going to have to start to, uh, you know, go into rebuttal periods. Let's thank our speaker again for a wonderful presentation. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks, all right, now we're in, we're in. Uh, Go ahead, Brown. We would like to know how many here have remarks to make to the rest of us. I'm sure Pat Butler has. I got to work on that. Uh, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Charles? No, no, I don't. We got we got it. Right. I might even okay. I got to work well, on my list. It's now, it's now eight, uh, close to eight twenty-six. I'd say three to four minutes. We'll we'll go about four minutes. Aaron, I'll give you a minute warning at three. Let's go to four minutes then. Four minutes. Uh, we'll right. four minutes. Okay. Jim will make motions. Got the timer here. Uh, All right, let's thank our speaker again. Let's get rolling. Yeah. And all you communists can leave if you want. <laughs>
can't get out of the bullshit thing. Chuck, Chuck, I need their names. Oh, you said you just walk up front. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay, who's going first? We got an open mic. Get going. Let's get the mic going. Get up there, Ted. Ted, get up there. Okay. All right, ready, and you're starting. I want to thank for an interesting talk. Um, actually, uh, 1984 is probably my favorite book of all time. I just love that book. And to answer Andy's question in a different way, it's Andy's um, I thought the book was extremely relevant. I think Orwell is extremely relevant for today. Um, in fact, uh, we had a rally when I was with Occupy on the NSA, and I um, gave a little talk on the parallel between um, what Orwell was talking about in 1984 and today, and it's really quite striking. Obviously, the surveillance, this rally that I just mentioned was on the NSA, and the surveillance now has is, is gotten to the point where the government wants to pretty much you know, know about everything, literally everything. Uh, Edward Snowden uh, said um, something to the effect that um, literally the NSA wants to know every word that we utter or write. Okay? It's, really, it's really beyond the pale. It's totally uh, big brother. So that's one parallel. Um, in 1984, people were taught to hate uh, the enemy. What are we taught now? You know, Al-Qaeda, the communists, this. Uh, there's an enemy, an enemies under our bed, enemies around every corner. Um, everything to uh, uh, detract, uh, distract us from what our government does to us and, and the poverty that they keep us in. In 1984, the people were poor. They were being made poor uh, every day. Um, there are a lot of parallels uh, and a lot of interesting concepts, like the concept of double thing, where uh, people um, in 1984 and today are taught to uh, take uh, totally, total bullshit as fact, or as plausible, or as reasonable. Like, global, and not just quote unquote bullshit, but I mean just outrageous things like global warming um, and climate change. We're supposed to we carry on as if it's not going on, or as if we can carry on uh, as usual, business as usual. Um, so we, we live in double think territory today. Um, in a capitalist society. Yeah, yeah, well, um, also, Orwell at the end especially, made, uh, uh, in 1984, made the point that, yeah, well, through the party, the party was interested in power. They weren't interested in the good of the people or any, any other nice niceties. And that's what our government is all about, okay? They, don't, they aren't interested in our welfare. They're certainly not interested in our quote-unquote rights, which are totally worthless, like the Fourth Amendment and others. So um, it's just amazing the parallels. Uh, one, just little, one last thing. Uh, I don't know if you all remember the scene with the lottery. The uh, oh, uh, what's his name? The, the, the hero uh, Winston uh, came upon some people making this big commotion about this, you know, exciting uh, thing that happened. Uh, they were talking about the lottery, okay? Because this was the government's, the party's way of, of pacifying people and making them think that they, there was actually hope uh, in their poverty. And what the hell do we have now? You know, billion dollar lotteries. Thank you. Uh, there's plenty of double think around. Like all you union heads and uh, socialists who think you're sympathetic to the poor when it's actually the poor that you're or dealing with one way or another, or it's getting a job is concerned, as far as uh, making a, uh, making ends meet. And uh, this book I mentioned, uh, Bernard Simmel, Imperialism and Social Reform, is about. Uh, how uh, uh, several European countries tried to thrust a big slice of Bismarckism. But 
Well, the other side of Europe, even Winston Churchill said that, supported to that effect in this book. Uh, well, anyway, uh, yeah, Mussolini, I understand, was a labor organizer beforehand. <laughs> Which is another example of double thinking. But anyway, uh, Orwell also wrote uh, uh, War is Peace, which I think is the best success. Uh, exposition of economic tapers the past you know, few decades. He even predicted the Vietnam War, although it wasn't specific about its location. He did predict a war that's not fought to win anything. And his location was rather general, but uh, you might figure that's still going on today. collecting emails, but he cares to get me one.
that was known as security risks. Uh, of course, I've said that a couple of times at talks here, but there was also something we don't know about, which there was a second list. And the second list, which McCarthy never made public, um, was of KGB agents within the CIA. And as soon as Dulles saw that list and realized it was from the Pond, which was a group within CIA, uh, in fact, if you Google the Pond CIA, you'll see a full confession from CIA of what they did. Um, the second list, which was not made public, so he was not reckless as he's been charged, um, was of KGB agents within the CIA. Um, yeah, now, he, the thing that I find questionable about socialists in the 30s uh, comes about from my study. Um, I found a treasure trove of a newspaper called The People's World, which was the precursor to, I think it was called The Daily Worker. And uh, it was the Communist Party newspaper of the 30s. I found these in Hyde Park at a garage sale, believe it or not. So I got a stack of the newspapers. And they also had, but they didn't know they had it, a device for sending messages uh, with Russian writing all over it. So I think I busted a 60-year-old uh, spy ring out of Hyde Park. Um, I did uh, call the CIA, and they said they did not have uh, the equipment that I had found at this garage sale, so I sent it to them, and it's now on display at the CIA headquarters. Um, but what happened was, is after World War II, all of the anti-Semitic <coughs> and ethnic cleansing things that Karl Marx and Frederick Engels wrote were removed. Not just removed by the Communist Party, but the socialists. For some reason they were embarrassed after World War II and didn't want to have that writing. They removed it all. Karl Marx saying that all Jews who did not renounce their religion have to be eliminated. Frederick Engels saying that Slavs were worthless. Poland, Czechoslovakia, all these countries had to be cleared out so that, guess what? Germany could move into those areas. Anyone who joined the socialist movement in the 1930s read that and said, that sounds good to me. Why were they taken out after World War II? Oh, I don't know, Auschwitz, Buchenwald, um, the death camps in Poland. All of a sudden, there's no difference between Marxists and Nazis. In the newspapers, the People's Newspaper of the late 1930s, they hail Adolf Hitler during the Hitler-Stalin peace pact as a new form of socialism. In fact, there are editorials I have read in the newspaper where they state that Hitler dealing with the Jews is just another way to deal with the rich. Um, why is it okay to throw bricks at Nazis but not socialists who know damn well what they believed if they joined in the 1930s. Um, thank you for your talk. And uh, I have always loved George Orwell. Um, I only found out recently the CIA did the animated film about Animal Farm and uh, released it in the 1950s and had to make changes because there were things in it that were too radical. Okay. Uh, for the American government to pay for. The time's up. But it was interesting to find out that the CIA had used Animal Farm in a slightly changed form to spread propaganda. Thank you. First of all, I want to thank our speakers tonight for a very interesting talk about George Orwell. I would 
and many new things tonight, including the origin of the title of our little here. Thank you for that. Now, I've had many debates with my good friend Mike Florence, who's sitting over there. I just talked to you just now. Some of the things he says I agree with. Some of the things he says I do not. And among the kind of things that he has that I do not agree with him about is his defense of Joe McCarthy. McCarthy was a, was a fraud and a demagogue, and in fact, and I think this is well known. And <coughs> of the lists he had turned in were not very well vetted. They too often contain the names of people who were not communists and who suffered enormous hardship as a result of being named by him. Yeah, they won. How many Lynn won? won? There and were 56. There were 56. And just a moment. Man, you had it's your it's turn, Mike. It's my turn now. One so fool, just name one. One fool at a time. And when you further throw into it that McCarthy had the habit of waving blank pieces of paper around and saying, well, these are the lists. Well, I didn't say that. No, you didn't, but other people can. They're liars. Including Irv Kupsinet, who, in his book, Cup the Man in the City, admittedly a very, very modest and title volume. Um, one day, when it was interviewing McCarthy, McCarthy waved his list around and said, and said there was my list of communists. McCarthy went to the bathroom, and as Cup pointed out, the instant McCarthy went to the bathroom, he picked up that list, and it was blank. I'm sorry, Mike. I'm going to take Herb Cuffs and Super Bowl viewers. Um, with regard to the question that I asked our speaker tonight about uh, the 1930s in Britain, I agree with most of what you said, including about the Spitfire. It's not so cut and dry at all that is all that. Appeasement went back all the way back through Baldwin to McDonald. Now, granted, Chamberlain was the one who made it most militant. But nevertheless, and, and I do not deny that in Britain there was a great move for pacifism and disarmament, which we've talked about. But I also maintain that nevertheless, there were a number of riots and disturbances in Britain in 1931 and 1932 that so frightened the right in Britain as to thinking a communist takeover was imminent. They felt that they had to side with Hitler and hence bring about a peace. And, oh yes, there were any number of people, not only among the upper crust in Great Britain, but even here in the United States, who believed that social, or that Nazism was the way of the future, and who for a long while pushed this. Henry Ford is perhaps the most prominent example in the United States. But there were many other industrialists in this country who all sided, who all thought this, and who all did business with Germany, including the DuPonts and a great many other people. And finally, in the United States, in the 30s, as has also been alluded to, uh, I don't necessarily buy the argument that central planning is always bad depends on who's doing the planning, what it's going to be done for, and also whether competing schemes are going to be permitted. And among the central planning that was done here in the United States were most of the programs of the New Deal. And Roosevelt was roundly denounced by the right in this country as being a socialist. And I would say people were promoting the idea that Nazism was the way of the and right. it could also be argued that President Roosevelt saved the, country, saved the capitalist system in this country. And that he produced a system that we all know and all know and to some extent enjoy. And I want to thank you, Tim, for telling me that my time is up. <laughs> <laughs>
again, I'd like to uh, thank our uh, speaker uh, this evening for uh, an absolutely riveting presentation. When I yes, when I first when I first saw the title, I kind of thought to myself, "My God, this is going to be another one of these." very, very dull, didactic polemics. It turned out to be the most fascinating thing that I have heard here at the college for a while. And I've heard many things here at the college that are indeed quite fascinating, and in some cases, totally unbelievable. However, um, uh, one of the things I would, uh, uh, one of the questions I would ask you, when you said that the uh, ruling classes in Great Britain uh, we're not particularly enamored of, uh, of the uh, Third Reich. Uh, I have heard from several reliable sources, including, he's dead now, a former officer in the German Army, who told me that it was common knowledge among even the junior officers in the German military that Edward the Brief, officially known as Edward the Eighth, um, was in rather open sympathy with Hitler, had made at least one trip there uh, as a uh, guest uh, of the uh, Nazi party, uh, appeared to be terribly impressed, and that the reason for his abdication did not have to do as much with Wallace Warfield Simpson is the fact that his sympathies were far too pro-German at a time when it appeared even then that the two countries were going to be going to war. Um, granted, the ties between the German upper class and the British upper class have always been strong up to and including the fact that that nice lady who lives in Buckingham Palace uh, is probably more German in her bloodlines than she is English. Uh, but, the fact of, but the fact of the matter is, uh, Edward VIII, uh, well, put yourself in his position. You are about to be crowned King of England. You have met this twice divorced woman, uh, an American, and uh, you are told to stop seeing her or uh, stop seeing yourself as a future king. Now, what are you going to do? You're going to do what English kings and French kings and German kaisers and Russian czars and Irish earls have done for a long time. You're going to realize that with a little bit of imagination, you can indeed have your cake and eat it. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, so uh, I, I kind of wonder if um, Edward VIII's loyalties and his sympathies weren't more of an issue than his involvement with uh, Wallace Warfield Simpson. Um, we heard a great deal uh, about socialism, communism, Marxism, bandied about this evening. And the fact of the matter is that the socialists, the communists, and the Marxists have very often been their own worst enemies because they have historically spent more time fighting among themselves as to who is doctrinally correct and uh, who is the most free of contradictions. I mean, even Jesuit theologians do not spend that much time splitting hairs, but these guys have spent more than a hundred years fighting against, not the capitalist class, but against, uh, against their, their, their own alleged heretics. Um, if they had hoped to have any kind of world domination, uh, they would have, I see, I, I'm, I'm being warned, they would have had to get their act together a long time before this. I have only this much to say to those groups. I'm afraid that time has run out, both for me and for them. Um, John Paul II, uh, as did apparently Harold Macmillan, uh, he called for, both of them called for, a middle way between capitalism and communism. Uh, perhaps that's what we're going to see in the next 50 or 100 years. A free so, market? No, not a free market. <laughs> I, I said a middle way between the two extremes. Now, Mike, you're going to have to learn to separate your wet dreams from reality. <laughs> Dad, come on.
I just want to let's thank our speaker again. I just wanted to say, apart from your, your presentation, um, I subscribe to all sorts of publications. I, I, I'm kind of fond of reading. All right, Shane, uh, it's nice seeing you. If you want, I'm neglected. I, I join more organizations than I could ever begin to make a list definitively. Sometimes my memberships expire and I renew them, and other times I don't. But and I go to meetings. I don't. I don't have a real high criteria for going to them. But now I learned that Mr. Orwell and Mr. McCarthy could arbitrarily and capriciously decide that I had been doing something wrong. Uh, I don't know by what authority. I don't know what sort of due process they're engaged in, let alone am I aware of anything that I'm doing or have done that is in error, unethical, criminal, yet somebody decided that such activities were illegal. And they compiled something, not just a list, but let's use a real term, it's a blacklist. Because you're going to take some action against those individuals as a result of their putting their name on that list. It's one of the darkest episodes in the history of this nation. The only thing that comes close to it is the passage of the Patriot Act. And what we mm -hmm. thought was going to happen. Oh, I to thought that. slavery was. To any justification for that activity to me is an affront to any sort of freedom of association, freedom of thought, and freedom of activity. It is nonsensical. With us do anything we can, if anything, find an organization that works to preclude that from ever happening again and buy a couple memberships. Thank you. John Mary Seattle. Get his name, John. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know something? It was nice to explore a lot of the benefits about the past. And perhaps a lot of us are living in the past. You know, I actually heard about something happening in the 1990s called the rise of capitalism and something about globalization. And, and, and maybe just recently that Africa was actually having some of the biggest growths in their economies in the last few years. You know, I find it kind of ironic when we go back onto these series of things that happened in the 30s and the 40s and the 50s, and sometimes history repeats itself. We just had a great economic recession, but we did learn something. And I think that was how government policy intervened to prevent a massive, massive meltdown of the economy. I think the second thing we learned was the value of a fair and free market, not oligarchic, crony capitalism. And I do know that we have some very major threats coming down the pipeline. We have a member who's attended here in the past who talked a lot about the dangers of Islamic fundamentalism. Now, I am not by any means against the Islamic religion or anybody else. You practice your religion, it's supposed to be a source of hope and comfort and love. But when it gets into hate, and it gets into killing people, and it's hijacked for purposes of gaining political power, and made as an excuse for genocide, that's when it's wrong. And we have a group right now called ISIS, 
that it's just as bad as the Nazi party ever was if you look at their extreme views and are actually doing a lot of the same practices that the Nazi party has done and are using a lot of the same tactics that the Nazi party did, particularly in lightning warfare, getting lists of people for names and in the towns and then immediately taking action. There was a brief interview, if you look, from Fresh Air dated a few weeks ago about the danger of this group and what it can pose to us. I'm going to close with this thought. History has been dominated by people who have done the impossible. And today, the button that is atomic devastation exists. Out of rebuttals, David, you're on. Well, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to um, spray some of my thoughts. I, um, I actually uh, used to read Orwell because I enjoyed reading Orwell for no other reason, except that um, one of the things I enjoyed about it was that Orwell held a lot of the views that I held in the 1960s that I ceased to hold subsequently. Um, what prompted me to get interested in writing a book about all of that initially was the fact that I saw various statements about Orwell that I thought were mistaken and inaccurate. Um, you know, um, 2003 was the centennial of all of Orwell's birth, born in 1903. And um, there was a big uh, surge of writings about Orwell and people talking about Orwell. And the same thing had happened earlier in, in 1984, of course, when uh, the long-awaited date uh, happened. Uh, and I, it irritated me a bit that certain people would say things about Orwell uh, that weren't true. So that got me into writing. I wrote a few articles about Orwell and book reviews because I didn't like the fact that there were these inaccuracies. And then, what led me on further to making a, more, a bigger project with this was that I'm very interested in where beliefs come from and how they develop and how belief systems uh, rise and fall. Um, and I was struck by the fact, the more I investigated, that most of Orwell's beliefs are very typical of uh, 1930s uh, leftist intellectuals. By the way, all, one of the things about Orwell was that he kept drawing attention to the fact that the, the intellectuals had different opinions to the, that of the great majority of the population. And he, he himself held opinions that were uh, similar to those of other intellectuals. But he, he was struck by the fact that um, intellectuals were different, that most of the left consisted of intellectuals, and most intellectuals were left or at least most intellectuals who had any political, over political activity uh, were leftists. And that this wasn't true of the majority of the population. Uh, so he, this is something that fascinated him, why this was, uh, why intellectuals had a particular uh, point of view that was different. And what strikes me is, as I look at uh, Orwell in detail, or I look at other people who wrote around that time, I, I've not just read Orwell, I've read his friends and the people who influenced him, um, is that there, there was a belief system among intellectuals uh, that was rarely challenged and that people just reiterated. And the, the idea that capitalism can't last much longer uh, was one of these beliefs. And obviously that was wrong. I mean, even if you think today that capitalism can't last much longer, you have to admit that people in the 30s got the timing wrong, right? <laughs> uh, they were a bit off with the timing. Um, so, um, you know, um, we heard about uh, global warming, and that's an example of something. I'm quite sure that in 10 years' time, uh, everybody in this room will agree that global warming is the biggest piece of silliness uh, that we've ever seen in our lifetime. Uh, and um, I'm, I'm actually coming here in a few weeks to give a talk about that, and I will prove to you that um, it's not going to last much longer. The game's up. 
uh, for, the, for the global warming scandal. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, just as intellectuals, now the ordinary people in this country and in Britain, they don't believe in global warming. Uh, and they didn't believe in the 1930s that capitalism was about to end. It's, it's the intellectuals who believe these things. Um, now, the intellectuals in the 1930s believe that capitalism was about to end. Uh, a few intellectuals believe that now, and I gave a talk here about David Graeber, he believes that, he believes that capitalism can't last much longer. Um, just like George Orwell did in the 1930s. Um, but the intellectuals believe that we've got a big crisis with um, <coughs> human-induced uh, climate change. But the ordinary people, uh, I think, are too sensible for this. Um, so they don't, they don't fall for it. Um, one little footnote about McCarthy. Um, McCarthy never wanted to make his list public. He was forced to do that. He was threatened with criminal charges. Oh, he, what, what, what McCarthy did was, he said, I have a list of people who Thank have been um, identified as security risks and nothing has been done about it. They've still, they've still kept their jobs. Well, he, he had informants in the FBI and he had a list of names. And we now know that, the, that we, uh, we, at least with 90% of them, that they were members of the Communist Party who had sworn that they weren't. Now, um, and we also know that many of them were directly controlled, we know, we know that many of them were directly controlled by, um, either by the KGB or by the GRU, uh, because there were these two Soviet espionage organizations in it. And McCarthy didn't want to make these names public, but he was forced by the Tidings Commission, they said, no, if you don't make it public, we'll charge you with contempt of Congress, you'll go to jail. And he, so eventually he gave in. A senator is not an agency of the government. I beg your pardon? Why do you, how does he make a senator are not an agency? He's not a department right, of justice. Right, right. But my point is it's a mistake to think that, uh, that this was a blacklist that McCarthy perpetrated. It, it, there was, nobody, was, nobody was blacklisted by McCarthy. Nobody. McCarthy just said that Did this is a list of people. Joke? And, and the government was trying to, the Truman administration was trying to cover it up. That's all. It's a typical political cover up, and he was trying to expose it. He was an idiot. No, I don't think McCarthy was uh, all that brilliant as a politician. I think he was a typical a politician who found an issue that he thought was important, and he didn't always handle it wisely. Uh, but um, uh, he certainly didn't intend it to be a blacklist. It wasn't a blacklist. All the people kept their jobs. Uh, they were never investigated, they were never fired. Um, <laughs> so, I, I mean, I think, now what Orwell did, I, I, don't know how you defend, I don't know how you defend what Orwell did, because all, all he had was his own supposition. He met some of these people, and he thought, well, you know, there's one, there's one point where Orwell says, as soon as I met someone, so I knew he was a fellow traveler, I can smell them. Um, you know, Orwell was... Um, like Arthur Kersler, his friend Arthur Kersler, who was a Arthur Kersler had been a communist and had been an active communist agent. Orwell was never a communist, um, but they agreed on this great threat of communism, and they were uh, toward the end of Orwell's life, and he continued with Kersler after this. They were constantly trying to ferret out communism uh, in, in uh, communist influence in various places, and there were communist agents of work. Uh, in Britain as well as in the United States, but there's an interesting difference. The, the, the controllers of these agents in Moscow made this decision, an, an interesting decision. They said in Britain, if they catch you, just confess and get it over with quickly. In the United States, deny to the last breath and make as much trouble as you can. So Alger Hiss and uh, the Rosenbergs and all these other communist spies did just that. Uh, and they made, they made as much trouble as they Chuck, possibly. it's a fact. Uh, we know all this. There was something called, uh, Charlie, you don't know about this, but there's something called the Venona tapes. Um, it's, all, it's all documented now. We know who these people were, right? Um, and uh, read the Venona tapes. It's all there. What radical there are actual transcripts. Anyway. <laughs> I feel there's a few things about Orwell I didn't get off my chest, although I tried to get some things off my chest. Um, uh, he's, he had a lot of interesting ideas on different things. Uh, one of the interesting things was that he was in many ways a traditionalist. And at the beginning of his socialist career, beginning in, with the Rosewood and Beer, 
Um, he's very much opposed to, well, that would be putting it wrongly. He thinks that machinery and modern industrial life has a bad effect on people. Uh, and one of his arguments in The Road to Wikipedia is that socialism, people don't like socialism. See, what the, road, what the second part of The Road to Wikipedia is mostly about is why it is that everybody isn't a socialist since it's so obviously right. Because he's a new convert, so he thinks it's so obviously right. So, uh, and so he blames <coughs> the way socialists talk uh, and behave um, for the fact that socialism isn't more attractive to people. And one of the things he feels is that uh, okay. socialism is identified with super-industrialization. And people don't like machinery. Janet? They don't like industrialization. Uh, and they're right not to like it, because it destroys something human in people. Uh, and he, so he argues strongly there. Now, he, that, that remains really throughout his, his life, but he gradually gets less. He gradually comes around to accepting high tech uh, in a way that um, he didn't accept early on. So that's, that's one, of the, one of his ideas. Uh, another of his ideas is uh, is that, like other 1930s intellectuals, he shared much with all 1930s intellectuals. And one of these was the the great threat of the falling birth rate. He was appalled by the fact that people were not having enough babies. Uh, now, by the way, he himself was sterile, and and, and uh, he had numerous sexual relations with many women, never produced any children. Uh, he ended up, he adopted a child, um, and, uh, and then his wife died, and he raised that child on his own before he became too seriously ill. Um, so he was very much, in, he, thought, he thought that one of the essentials of any society was what he called philoprogenitiveness. In other words, a high valuation on having babies. Uh, and this was, this was uh, you know, in the 1930s, this was one of the, this was the global warming of the 1930s, was the falling birth rate. Um, and um, uh, everybody believed in it. Everybody thought it was terrible. The other thing that was, that was common in the 1930s, of course, was racial hygiene, sterilizing the unfit, uh, sterilizing the, the feeble-minded and that sort of thing. This was commonplace, more in the 20s, but into the 30s in Britain and France and the United States. Um, so all he all didn't go in for the he didn't like the sterilizing the unfit thing and he was against eugenics. Mm. Uh, but he was very much in favor with just having babies. He thought this was uh, <coughs> tremendously important. Um, uh, another thing I didn't mention that I should have mentioned really is some of the influences on all Um one of the big influence of course the biggest influence of all on all can anybody guess what well, the biggest influence of all on was on Orwell. That's Gulliver's Travels by Jonathan Swift. Uh, he, he got that book. Um, uh, he learned that he was going to get it on, on, on uh, his eighth birthday. And the night before his eighth birth birthday, he found this present and read it that night. Um, and then he read it many times after that. Um, and I said that we don't know what, what um, Orwell's views were uh, before he converted to socialism in 1936. But... <clears throat> It, it's not recorded in any of his extant writings, but people who know him at that time say that he called himself a Tory anarchist. And the interesting thing is, that was the description he gave of Jonathan Swift, the Tory anarchist. And the, there were many things about Gulliver's Travels and the whole approach to life that stayed with it. And one of these was the opposition to machinery, because Gulliver, uh, Jonathan Swift was very skeptical about the benefits of industrialization. Uh, and so this carried over into uh, George Orwell. Um, at a certain point, Orwell decided he was going to write what we now call, he didn't use the term, a dystopian novel, a novel about a horrible future. Um, and, and so he started reading all the novels like that that he could find. And it, it, was, it took a long time trying to get hold of the book called We by Zamyatin, Yevgeny Zamyatin. Uh, there's a book written, I don't know, maybe 1915 or something like that. Um, no, it was, it was after the Russian Revolution, so maybe 19, uh, 1925. Um, uh, and the plot's very similar to 1984. 
It's not as good a book as 1984, but it's, um, it's certainly uh, greatly influenced. Uh, and of course, when Orwell was a young man, the, one of the big sensations was Aldous Huxley's uh, Brave New World. And there's a big disagreement. Uh, Orwell, 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 of course, didn't think we would ever have. Orwell was pessimistic about the prospects for um, higher living standards. Whereas Aldous Huxley, probably more accurately, foresaw that, that there would be a higher living standards. Uh, and Aldous Huxley looked at these more subtle ways of conditioning people. Uh, Orwell thought that society wouldn't be rich enough to have that luxury, um, and that it would be more brutal. And this was a, a disagreement between them. Uh, in, in different ways, Huxley, who was about 10 years older than Orwell, but of course greatly outlived him because Orwell died so young. Uh, Huxley um, and Orwell, both in different ways, believed that the enemy was hedonism, the worship of pure pleasure. Um, and, um, but, they had, but there was a difference. Um, Huxley thought that if you, as you see in um, Brave New World, that if you allow this pleasure seeking to take over, there's going to be this sort of primal instinct for sort of savagery and pain is going to emerge. Uh, whereas Orwell didn't think like that. What he did think was that if people are hedonistic, they won't be able, to, they will be easy meat for the fascists or the communists. They will, they will be, they won't be able to withstand the onslaughts of these fanatics. The fanatics don't believe in pleasure. They believe in their belief system and they want to impose it on everybody. So this was, this was the difference. Uh, there between Huxley and Orwell. Thank you.